Uh, well, uh, I'd like to start actually by asking a question. You know, I, I believe that most everyone goes through at least some period of time in their life when they believe that they would really enjoy the experience and would like to be an astronaut and go into space. Now, who, who's willing to admit that they at least at one point in time would have loved to do that? So, uh, and how many people, if, if it was free and if it was safe, how many of you would go today? Okay, so pretty much everybody would still like to go. And uh, as I think many of you already you do know that I uh, had the chance to, to go myself about a year ago. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about today is uh, what is kind of as an outgrowth of uh, my personal journey and uh, a lot of other entrepreneurs who have, have followed on or also simultaneously doing this, uh, that has really created a, a new space race uh, that has gone a lot further than I think most people realize and I believe is really going to open the door uh, for really anyone who wishes to go to space to get a chance to do that. Uh, so let me first of all mention that again that uh, it was last October, a year ago October, October 12th, is when I became the 483rd person to ever orbit the Earth and the sixth private citizen. Uh, in fact, every private citizen that's flown, of which there have been seven, uh, they've all flown with my company, Space Adventures. Uh, and I'm also the first second generation American to fly. I flew with the first second generation Russian uh, at that same time. And I, but I went on a very different path than my father did. Of course, he was a, a government astronaut with NASA. He flew on uh, Skylab as well as the space shuttle. Uh, but if you think about how most people perceive space travel today, you know, it's, it's both expensive and it is somewhat dangerous. And so therefore, it's fairly uncommon. In fact, I already mentioned that, uh, you know, there's only been about, you know, 500 people in history that now have gone. Uh, but this is what's now undergoing such a, a really profound change and why I think that Anyone in this room who really sets their mind on it will be able to uh, live and work and play in space in the not terribly distant future. Now, if you go back to the roots of space travel, you know, 50 years ago, space had yet to be conquered at all. You know, in the very beginning, uh, you know, the Russians put up Sputnik, then the Russians put up the first uh, person, Yuri Gagarin, then the Russians also had the first spacewalker, uh, Alexei, Alexei Leonov, who's actually a friend of mine now. Uh, then, of course, Neil Armstrong uh, walked on the moon. And that all happened within about the first 10 years. And ever since then, you know, we've uh, really been stuck in low Earth orbit. And we've been shuttling a lot of things back and forth, literally. Uh, but something hasn't happened. And that thing that really hasn't happened is the, we've never achieved the you know, Stanley Kubrick 2001 vision of the future that's now 10 years old. And a lot of us who grew up in the Apollo era and grew up watching 2001 and reading those books, I think we're disappointed that that didn't happen. And there's a recent documentary out called Orphans of Apollo. And actually, when I saw that movie, I thought, I'm one of those. You know, I'm one of these people who was inspired to get in, in science, into science and technology uh, that, uh, you know, with the hope of, of living in space one day. But it never, really, it never really manifested for us. But what happened is a lot of those same people, a lot of those orphans, have, in the last 20 years, been working their way into uh, the, into, into either science and technology businesses or even the space business in some really interesting ways. For example, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Peter Diamandis, started a group called SEDS, the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. He also started the International Space University. He also co-founded with a bunch of us uh, the X Prize, where we paid a $10 million prize for the first private suborbital vehicle that did fly into space in 2004. We started a company called Zero G Corp that is the only private company that flies parabolic uh, flights. We also started Space Adventures, which is where, how I managed to get to space myself. But it's interesting to see how even those who didn't go straight into space, how the people, all these orphans that, went and, that were in many ways responsible for the technological boom that we've all just lived through, how many of them are setting their sights back into this new space race. For example, most of you know Elon Musk, the founder of PayPal. He also does Tesla motor cars that you've probably heard of. Well, you might know of his company, SpaceX. They have already now put satellites in orbit. They have a contract that in the next couple of years, they'll start taking cargo back and forth to the International Space Station. And after that, they hope to uh, get the contract to start taking uh, uh, astronauts back and forth to the space station. You know, just north of us here in Dallas, a good friend of mine in the games industry, a guy named John Carmack, has a company called id Software. He's the author of the Doom and Quake series of games, some of the most popular games uh, in the world. He has a space company now, too, called Armadillo Aerospace. He's been winning a bunch of prizes. He's on the threshold of being in space. Uh, and, uh, you know, his first vehicle will be going suborbitally, but he, of course, hopes to go to orbit as well. We've got Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com. He's got a space company called Blue Origin. They're also doing uh, both suborbital uh, vehicles as well as they now are winning some contracts with NASA uh, to do crew capsules. 
We've got a, a guy named Robert Bigelow, who's a hotel mogul in Las Vegas, who already has two inflatable uh, space station modules that have already flown into space. Probably, most of you probably have not heard of this. Uh, and his plan is to basically build both space hotels as well as to put up private space stations for private use as well as for use by uh, serious researchers, if not NASA. You probably have heard of Richard Branson, the guy that gets a lot of credit for work that I think my friends all did. Uh, you know, he, uh, he has, uh, you know, they painted Virgin Galactic on the back of the uh, XPRIZE flights, but he has followed it up and now he's put many, many millions of dollars into Virgin Galactic in his uh, building with Burt Rattan Spaceship Two. Uh, they'll be flying uh, passengers suborbitally here in uh, uh, just a couple of years. Another one that might be less known, Jeff Grayson out there, also in Mojave, has a company called XCOR Aerospace. They've got their engines going, their airframes being built. They hope to have a single stage orbit space plane. Uh, of course, myself, uh, you know, I really come from the computer game industry also. You know, I built uh, the Ultima series of games, my first company, Origin, next company, NCSoft. Uh, but it became part of the XPRIZE in Space Adventures and have now flown myself into space and continue with my passion into space. But what's interesting is even what I'll call the old guard, even the people that you would call the NASA uh, prime subcontractors, they also are now getting into what I'll call the privatization of human spaceflight. They've already done this with, with satellites. I mean, NASA does not launch its own satellites. NASA buys a launch service from a lot of these prime contractors. The vehicles that are used to launch satellites are not yet human rated because they were planned to just carry cargo. But it's a lot easier to take something that already works and uh, determine its safety or increase its safety to make sure it's useful for putting people into space than it is to build something from scratch. And so those guys are also now starting to compete. And so what's happening is this new space race, the pace of it, which, you know, when I first started investing to try to find my own way space, you know, it was very, a pretty hard slog with lots of failures along the way. But the speed with which this new space race is moving is, has increased very, very quickly. And I think it's really because the heavy lifting has already been done. You know, the early work that NASA did is now in the public domain. I mean, all their, their results are in the public domain. All of the materials they've made, carbon fiber, special alloys of aluminum, all that stuff, it's now found in everyday objects all over the world. You can, you know, uh, you know the cryogenic uh, fluid pumps are used in your air conditioners and things that, uh, you know, were really developed for, for rocket engines. And here's a really great case study for that. If you go to, up to uh, John Carmack's launches that he does at Cato Mills just outside of Dallas, and you look at his beautiful, amazing rocket that if you get a chance to watch it, it's, uh, you know, great barnstorming fun with rockets. Uh, you know, you, you look at the, the amazing thing he's done is, for example, he invented a non-ablative rocket nozzle so his engine could be used over and over and over again. A great invention he had to work very hard at. He also is a computer software guy, so he did a great uh, navigation and control scheme, which uh, I wouldn't have even tackled as a software guy, but he's made it, done it extremely well. He had a third part that was special, which is his fuel tanks to hold big volumes of cryogenic fuel, required that special alloy I mentioned, and he had to buy them from a specialization shop to make them and test it very, very carefully. But other than those three parts, every other part of his rocket that can go to space and back, you can buy on the internet. And he pretty, pretty much does. I mean, he buys them out of catalogs on the internet. And, uh, and literally, like I was mentioning, the valves and pumps and all computers and GPS boards, accelerometers and all that stuff, he just buys and assembles and they put it together in a shop and go out in the backyard and launch it. And so at this point, literally any high school or college shop, uh, you know, frankly, can build rockets to go into space. And that's sort of what's happening. I mean, a lot of people competing for, uh, for this activity in space really are mom and pop garage shops or, or schools. But just a few days ago, the future of humanity in space, or especially America in space, changed profoundly. Uh, on February 1st, the president's new budget, as well as Charlie Bolden, the new NASA administrator, came out and said that they are canceling NASA's constellation plans, which are our, the, the U.S. national plan for returning to the moon, Mars, and beyond. And if you're a space enthusiast like me, your first response to that is like, oh, what a terrible tragedy that, it, that is. And in fact, I personally do wish it had continued. I think it's, a, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we need a national space program that does continue to move beyond. But there's, what's interesting is, I actually think the current plan is probably a better plan, and I'll explain why. When, if you look at the Constellation plan, in just the next five years out of the, you know, 20 or 30 that it was planned to, uh, to take, it's going to take about $25 billion to just proceed for the first five years of that. And that's if things go well, and if budgets remain high, 
And so to sustain that for 30 years is actually a, a pipe dream, you might say, that, that uh, may or may not be sustainable. And so what they've done is they've said, instead of sending that 25 billion there, we're gonna actually invest that 25 billion in science and technology, which I think is a great place to spend it. And they've increased the NASA budget by six million, six billion, uh, which they're gonna put towards the privatization of space by buying supplies and services from the commercial industry that I just described. And so what's gonna happen is the economics of space are now about to change radically. For example, if you look at the space station, which we just spent 20 years building it, we spent $100 billion building it, $2 billion a year just to keep it in space, and about $300 million or so per astronaut to go up there and do work. And you know, I don't know about your calculus, but when I try to think of what science or commercial activity that I could support with that kind of uh, what I'll call front end loading of cost, it's actually a pretty hard case to make. Um, on the other hand, if you could reduce the cost of access to space by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100, a really important thing begins to occur. And I believe that's achievable. And for example, every other form of transportation that we use, cars, boats, trains, and planes, all cost about three times the energy that you put into it. And the only reason rockets don't, which cost about 100 times, is because you throw away the vehicle every time. So imagine every time you went to the gas station, you crushed your car and went and bought another one. It'd be pretty hard, it'd be pretty pricey to, get, to go uh, to drive around. But, uh, but what's happening is as these guys are pursuing more and more truly reusable, not like the current shuttle where every time they get it back, they disassemble it and take off all the parts and put it back together. But I mean, something that you literally fill up with gas and go launch again, which by the way is what John Carmack flies his six times a day already. And so it's quite doable. All those entrepreneurs believe they can drop the price by at least a factor of 10. Most of them plan on a factor of 100. But what, what happens is that price comes down, is you know, when I went into space, you know, my, I paid a lot of money to go. And so I said, you know, I wanna do a little work up there and maybe offset some of that cost and see if I might even make a profit, uh, you know, on my, on my trip, which by the way, I did not. Um, <laughs> however, I did start businesses that I believe are worth a significant fraction of even the price I paid. And so I actually think that the price, that if you can get the price of a human into space to below $10 million, I believe there's lots of work that can be done that means that you can basically go for free because you can pay if you uh, pay yourself through entrepreneurial effort. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Like one of the things I did is I took up uh, protein molecules and grew protein crystals in microgravity. And it turns out that that's particularly worthwhile for pharmaceutical companies who want to know the precise protein structure, as one of our speakers was talking about earlier, for drug development to create molecules to bond with that protein. And especially if it's a disease protein, you can stop that disease from forming. But if you grow these crystals on the ground, turbulence, little uh, convection currents during the crystallization process, disturb the growth, they grow smaller and less pure. But if you grow them in space, they get bigger and more pure, and you can cut years and millions of dollars off drug development. Another company here in town called Astrotech. It actually grew out of a company I invested in years ago called Spacehab. Astrotech is also flying uh, biological activity, biological work in space. They're actually doing vaccine development. They've flown, I've flown mine twice now. They've flown theirs about 10 times. Uh, but they have a thriving business doing biological research in space. But again, the cost is what's really important. And I believe as soon as you get below that line, there's going to be an explosion of entrepreneurial activity in space. So here's kind of my vision of our future in space. I mean, I believe the revolution is happening right now. You know, now is the time for you guys to start planning either your personal journeys into space or your personal businesses that'll take to advantage of space because here's what I think is happening like right this moment. You know, this is, uh, for example, John Carmack's plan for a suborbital space vehicle that takes people into space. I don't know about you, but I would think that'd be a pretty damn cool thing to get on. You know, actually one of my first plans is I want to ride it up and then jump off. Is going to really what I want to do. But, but he's going to be flying people into space here in literally just three to five years. You know, SpaceX, I mentioned already about, uh, you know, cargo to the ISS basically this year, crew to the ISS uh, really within, you know, another three to five years. And they're going to again start reducing those costs. There's a company in England called Reaction Engines uh, that is building something called Skylon. And uh, that's a complete single stage to low Earth orbit space plane that can take about 10 tons of cargo and or people. Uh, if they pull that off, uh, which are backed by, the, by their UK government. Uh, if they pull it off, it'll be, again be one of the huge game changers if, if they succeed, but that's probably 10 to 15 years off. You know, this is a Bigelow Aerospace's plan for their space station. So if you want to go stay in their space hotel, they're already taking reservations. Uh, you know, theirs will still be fairly pricey, so to speak. Uh, you know, in my mind, uh, you know, do some work while you're up there, take some biological crystals or something and pay for your flight. <coughs> 
And you know, when you talk about getting back to the moon, even though we've now, you know, we're, we, it appears that we're going to abandon our uh, you know, direct government-sponsored plans to go to the moon, you know, the, the uh, Google, excuse me, the, uh, the original X Prize, which was a $10 million prize for the first uh, uh, suborbital vehicle, we've now expanded those. And one of those that we have is the Google Lunar X Prize, where Google has put up $25 million for the first private rovers on the moon that we expect people to have won within four to eight years. So four to eight years from now, there'll be private vehicles roving around on the moon. And it's only a question of time after that before we start sending people onto the moon. Uh, you know, this is a vision for lunar habitats. One of my favorite little pieces out of this is that on the moon with one sixth gravity, you can actually fly under your own power, uh, which is one of the things I'm looking forward to do. Don't know about you. And, and that, that leaves us that, that you're doing what I'll call the heavy lifting, pushing us beyond Earth out into places like Mars. That actually is a dramatically more complex problem. It's something that private industry probably isn't up to. Uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. And so in my mind, that's the right uh, place to uh, have uh, NASA targeting is, uh, is things that are well beyond low Earth orbit uh, and still fairly far beyond the capabilities of, of private industry. And you know, I'd like to close by just talking about uh, you know, why I think that not only is this great fun that I think you guys would already think it'd be cool to go into space, uh, you know, why I think there's great business opportunities now that have emerged in space, but also why it's important. You know, I've gotten to know Stephen Hawking uh, over the last few years because I took him on a zero-G flight with our company, uh, Zero-G Corp. Uh, and uh, he and his daughter, uh, Lucy, wrote a, a children's book about space, and I took it with me to space. Uh, and uh, one of the things, he, he's actually, by the way, in spite of the fact that he's confined to a wheelchair, uh, he is a great explorer. You know, he's, already, he's been all over the world, down to Antarctica and places I've been to, that, uh, uh, and of course into microgravity, as I have been to. And he is a very outspoken person on the importance of humanity going into space. He very commonly notes that if humanity does not spread off the planet Earth, ultimately we are doomed because inevitably there will be, in the span of time, crises on a planetary level. And so for humanity to, to survive, we really do need to become multi-planet. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.